Hey, let's pray this morning as we dive into our message. God, we're so thankful for an opportunity that you give us to remember all the joyous things about Christmas as we decorate our homes, as we put lights up around our homes, as we, as we do the things that we do. God, we know that in decking our hall out, uh, God, and when we decorate our homes, all that symbolism, all the things that it, it reminds us of and, and tells us about you. God, we thank you for an opportunity we have this morning to remember the truth of a God who loves us so much. God, that you loved us so much you sent Jesus to this earth in the form of a human being. Uh, what a cool truth. And the fact that we get to celebrate that together this month, God, we're going to have a lot of fun doing it. And we're so thankful for you. We ask that you would teach us something this morning. That your Holy Spirit would illuminate within us, God, and, and, and show us an area of our lives maybe that we need to be better transformed into the likeness of your son. That's our goal. God, we want to walk away this morning reflecting the light of your son. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, symbolism is, is just one of my favorite things. I love all the symbolism of, of Christmas. Uh, one symbolism is, is the Christmas tree. You know, we love putting up a tree. And let me tell you just the two things that I love about Christmas trees. Uh, well, one obvious thing, I love that we get to hang on it, all the things, all the memories and the things that we look back and are thankful for. Uh, but one of my favorite pieces of symbolism about a Christmas tree, you look at these trees here, they're all, they're all pointing up and reminding us in the Christmas season as we tend to get distracted and, and our focus gets turned off of where it needs to be, it reminds us that all the, the joy and all the truth of why we celebrate Christmas belongs to God. And the other thing I love is the, the symbolism of a tree. You know, we have a tree here where last week there was a cross. Jesus gave his life for us on a tree. And it was very likely that on the day of his birth, that cross was still in the form of a tree. There was a tree growing somewhere, living, that 30-odd-some years later, our Savior would give his life on it for us. A tree, right in, in and of itself, so much cool symbolism. You know my favorite symbol of Christmas is light. You know? We put light everywhere, don't we? We put it on our trees. We put it on our gutters of our houses. We, you know, cover our homes with light. We put it in our, in our tinsel, and then we put light everywhere all over the place, right? And we even, I saw this the other day. Oh, man. Man, we love using light at Christmas. And let me tell you why I love light so much and why I think it's such a beautiful symbol of Christmas. And we can find the truth in John chapter 8. Let me read this. I'm going to put it up on the screen for you. It says, Jesus spoke to the people once more and said this, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. You see, Jesus uses this word, you won't have to walk in darkness. And I think it's important for us to pause and understand what darkness is, especially how it relates to Jesus. You, darkness, by definition, is the absence of light. Right? A lot of times we like to think of darkness uh, as the opposite of light, but really what it is, it's the absence. If you have a, a room where there is no light, what you would use to describe that is, is total darkness. The best example of darkness in Scripture is in the second verse of the entire Bible. So if you'd grab a Bible and turn there with me, it should be really easy to find. Genesis, the very first book of the Bible. Now, we're going to look at the very second verse first. And you'll notice right there in that second verse, it says, The earth was formless, and it was empty, and darkness covered the deep waters. You see that? It says that the, it ex describes the existence of, of, or non-existence of everything as, as a, a very clear word, that darkness it was without form and empty and dark 
And then in verse 3, it says, Then God said, Let there be, say it with me, light. light. And there was light. You want to think about the, the absence of light. The Bible very clearly describes before God said those words, it was utterly darkness. There was an absence of light until God spoke it into existence. I remember when I was um, in college, I got a job as a, a counselor at a camp called Hume Lake. And when there was a, a one day in between campers being at the camp, all the staff would do activities together. And one day, um, they had planned a scavenger hunt for us. And I remember it was at nighttime, and it was a really, really big property, and there was this beautiful lake called Hume Lake. And it was a dark night. There was no moon in the sky. It was just really, really dark. And we got a clue. And the only thing on that piece of paper to know where we were supposed to go next was the word blue. And we had no idea what that meant. We're just like, what are we supposed to do? And we look around, and sure enough, the night was dark enough that about a football field away, we saw this small blue light. We thought, well, that's probably where we're supposed to go. So we headed over to that light. And as soon as we got there, there was nobody. There was nothing happening. There was just a blue light hanging there. But sure enough, once we got there, we looked around again, and, and another direction, about a football field away, we saw another blue light. And this one happened to be at the entrance to the lake. So we go over to that blue light, and there's somebody there, and they just point at a boat, a rowboat, and they hand us a set of oars, and they, they point out in the middle of the lake. And at this point, we don't know, I guess we get in it, and we just start rowing into the middle of a dark lake. And sure enough, at the other side of the lake, we see this little blue light, and we know where we're supposed to go. Isn't it just amazing how in, in a really, really dark space, a little bit of light just kind of breaks through that? Isn't it amazing? We've heard the phrase that light pierces darkness. You know, when I sleep, I love a dark room. In fact, we were on vacation recently, and the alarm clock next to the bed had such a bright LED that we had to, like, take a towel and put it over it because the room looked like it was, you know, like, lit up when we didn't want it to be. Just that little bit of light can pierce that darkness, right? Side note, just kind of off subject here for a moment, but as I was preparing this, God revealed something to me that I thought was really cool, so I want to share this one line with you. We know the phrase that light pierces darkness. But do you know that the day of Calvary when Jesus gave his life on the cross it was the one time in history that darkness pierced the light? Jesus claims to be the light. In that one moment where Satan thought he had the upper hand, we, we saw darkness pierce our Savior to a cross. But usually, right, the way we understand light is that light pierces darkness. Another example of that, if you remember last year around Christmas time here at ACC, we talked about the 400 years between the Old Testament and the New Testament. In other words, when you have your, your Bible and you're looking at the Old Testament in Malachi, where it ends and then where Matthew picks up, there was a period of 400 years. Now, I want you to understand that 16 generations where there were no prophets, no messengers from God, no angels, no miracles, total silence from God to his people. And that must have felt like darkness. To, to know that you're one of God's chosen people and yet for some reason you, you can't even just, God seems absent. You seem like you've been abandoned in darkness. I think the only thing that you must have had to cling, cling to as a, as, a, as a Jewish person during those 400 years was to some of the promises of the old prophets. As they opened up their scrolls and saw these promises of a coming Savior that's all they had to cling on to, was a little bit of hope. In fact, we see, let me show you an example in Isaiah, in chapter 9. I'll put this on the screen for you. It says, 
Nevertheless, the time of darkness and despair will not go on forever. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. I imagine that in this period of darkness, this 400-year period of silence, generation after generation after generation waiting for a Messiah, a Savior, a light to come into this earth, that they must have clung to a verse like this, knowing that a time of darkness and despair will not go on forever. That the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. I think this is a verse they probably talked about often, just just wait. Maybe it's going to be tomorrow. And then we see Isaiah just a few verses later. Isaiah 9 verse 6 says this, For a child is born to us. A son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. You see, so the Jewish people, they had an understanding. They knew that at some point there was a coming child. There was this coming great light. They had an understanding that something good was going to break the darkness. I don't know for certain, but I believe that that star over Bethlehem It must have been blinding. You guys know the feeling when you walk out of a dark space. You walk out of a a movie theater. And it's still the daytime and you walk out and that light just hits you. It's blinding, isn't it? And I like to to understand, the way I, I picture it, 400 years of silence of darkness, of feeling like you've been abandoned by God, and then all of a sudden there's this star, this this light over the town of Bethlehem. I bet that people saw it, and we we even know that the wise men, the the magi, they knew that a child was going to be born and that they would see a great light. They, They understood and knew that they were supposed to go. That must have been a beautiful, beautiful star. And it helps us understand not only the Jewish faith and their understanding of light, but it also helps us to understand what darkness looks like. So let's go back to John chapter 8. And I want to give you a little bit of context. In John chapter 8, remember, this is where Jesus has made an incredibly bold profession. He says, I am the light of the world. Let me tell you what's happened. All right, sometimes we read pieces of Scripture and when we read them out of context, we don't fully grasp the scenario and the context in which Jesus said that statement. Let me give it to you. If you go back just one chapter, you see where Jesus is at when he says this. It's a thing called the Feast of Tabernacles. And what the Feast of Tabernacles is, another way of translating it is a, a Feast of Booths. They would set up these tents these booths, and they would stay, and it was basically a one-week-long festival, a party, and the purpose of which was to remind them about when God brought them out of Israel, and they had to sleep in these tents. And then one thing they did to really remember how God was with them and led them in the wilderness is in every corner of the temple, they put up a 75-foot-tall menorah a big candle, a big flame, if you will, at every corner of the temple. 75 feet tall, that's like twice the height of our our ACC building. Huge. And they'd put one at every corner, and at night they would light it. And they, they said that the light during this Feast of Tabernacles illuminated the entire temple. It gave everyone uh, so much light that it seemed like daytime. And it helped them to remember the pillar of fire that led the Israelites in the evening. And with that pillar of fire and the reminder of what it was, just the the understanding that that these candles, this light reminded the Israelite people that God was the one who led them and directed them during that time. 
This is the context. This is that moment where in the Feast of Tabernacles, as people are celebrating the God who brought them out of the wilderness, as they are putting up these great lights to illuminate the temple, this is the context in which Jesus steps forward and makes this claim. He's saying this, do you know that light that God brought to this earth back in Genesis? You know the light, the pillar of fire that led you in the wilderness? I am the light of the world. Understanding that, that claim in that context is vitally important. And then what happens is clearly it makes the religious leaders angry. And in chapter 8, verse 13, here's how they reply. The Pharisees replied, you are making those claims about yourself. Such testimony is not valid. Here's basically what they're saying is, you can't just make this huge claim about yourself. You can't, one person can't just stand up and say whatever they want and just make it true. You can't just claim this. And then Jesus responds in verse 14. Jesus told them, these claims are valid even though I make them about myself. For I know where I came from and I know where I am going, but you do not know this about me. Notice Jesus uses these two phrases. He says, I know where I've been and I know where I'm going. And you just don't understand this truth about me. It makes you wonder, what is he talking about? Where he's been and where he's going. And one thing I think he might be pointing to, and this idea of I know where I came from, when he says that, it takes us again back to Genesis chapter 1. I hope you've noticed this before in your reading of Genesis but if not, I want, let me show you something that's somewhat hidden in Scripture that is a really cool truth about the creation account. In verse 26, then God said, let us make human beings in our image. Let us make human beings in in our image. You see what's happening there? God is talking about himself in a plural form. God isn't saying, now let me make man in my image. He's saying, let us make man in our image. What we have there is we have God the Father, Jesus Christ the Son, and the Holy Spirit huddled together to create the world. When Jesus says, I know where I've come from, what he's saying is, I was there at the very beginning. I'm the one who called light into existence. I am the light. I know where I came from. Before any of this even existed, I was there. And then we have this other thing that he says. Not only does he know where he came from, he says, I know where I'm going. Check this out. Revelations 21 we have Genesis, which is the account from the beginning, and then Revelation is an account we have of how, uh, kind, of kind of the end of, of this story. And he says this, I saw no temple in the city, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple, and the city has no need of sun or moon, for the glory of God illuminates the city, and the Lamb is its light." Let me tell you what John is talking about right here. In John's vision, he's saying that all of the, the earth, the way we know it now, has all been destroyed. And God is creating a, a new Jerusalem, a new, a new heaven and a new earth. And in his new earth, we know in scripture, there isn't going to be a need for a sun or a moon. Because Jesus is saying, not only I know where I've been, I know where I'm going. And I know that the light that I have the light that I am is enough to illuminate the new heaven I plan to create. We see the whole gamut of Genesis to Revelation. Jesus makes this incredible claim that he is the light of the world. 
So, so now what? What does that mean for you and I at Christmas? One of the things I, I really want to make sure we understand is this truth. I'm going to put it on the screen for you. Darkness is the absence of light. And notice I used the capital L there for you. Why don't you guys say this with me? Darkness is the absence of light. You see, the truth is, is that when you don't have Jesus in your life, you don't have the light in your life. What you have in an absence of light is darkness. You have darkness. That's what You look back maybe in your life right now, those of you who are in this room, and you're saying, you know what? I don't have Jesus in my life. I don't have the light in my life. My guess is that when you read Genesis chapter 1 verse 2, and you hear words like formless and empty and dark, you can take those words and actually see how they fit in to your life right now. That you feel formless, that you feel like you don't have a purpose, that you don't, you just, your identity is, is not formed. You don't realize who you are and how much you are loved by God. You're formless. And maybe you feel empty, that you, you feel like there's just a hole that you can't figure out how to fill it. And you just, you're missing something in your life. And, and you would describe that feeling as empty. And many of you would understand that word darkness. Maybe it's a, a deep depression or just a feeling of, of uh, you're missing something and there's just a darkness in your life. And let me tell you why you have this formlessness, emptiness, and darkness in your life. It's because in the absence of light is darkness. And the way to fix it is to invite the light, Jesus Christ, to be a part of your life. Maybe that's why you're here this morning is you needed to hear that truth that you need the light of Christ in your life today. Now for believer, brother and sister in Christ, those of you who have already given your life to Jesus, when you ask, okay, Matt, I already have Jesus in my life. So what for me? What can I do with this message? Let me put it really, really plainly. You have the light of Christ in you. Let it shine this Christmas. Matthew 5, 14 through 16 puts it really clearly. It says, here's another way to put it. You're here to be light, bringing out God colors in the world. God is not a secret to be kept. We're going public with this, as public as a city on a hill. If I make you light bearers, you don't think I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? I'm putting you on a light stand. Now that I've put you there on a hilltop, on a light stand, shine. Keep open house. Be generous with your lives. Open up to others. You'll prompt people to open up with God, the generous Father in heaven. Here's the truth about why I love light so much at Christmas. is because I've given my life to Jesus. And He has filled my heart. He has changed my life. And I have the light of Christ in me. And I have, the, especially during Christmas time, as we hang lights on our homes and we put lights in our trees and we put lights all over the, our cars and we do whatever it is because we understand the truth that Jesus is the light. And that light, being a part of my life, I want to do everything I can this Christmas to let it shine to those around me. We live in a very dark world. There are people all over the place that are feeling like they're living in darkness and we have the ability to let the light of Jesus shine on them and in them and through them. The Bible says, open up your homes. Walk cookies across the street. Spend time with your family in God's word, reading through the Christmas account. Go to that, that coworker that's been 
maybe on your nerves and, and share something awesome with them about the change that Jesus has made in your life. You have the ability, the so what for you is let the light shine through you. And for those of you who have still not invited the light to be a part of your life, that Jesus isn't a part of your life, hey, I believe that God put you in this room this morning to hear that word from me, through me, that Jesus is speaking through me to you right now, that you ought to change that today. And I want to encourage you, I know it will take boldness, but I want to encourage you to come up and talk to me after service so I can tell you about how Jesus has changed my life and how he wants to do the same for you. Let's pray together. Father, we are thankful for all the, the symbolism of light. God, we're most thankful for you, the light of the world, that at the very moment that that time, as far as we understand it, began, you called light, and it was. And God, throughout the Old Testament, you, you use light as a, a symbol and a way to, to lead people. And then in the New Testament, God, when you make this uh, proclamation that you are the light of the world, help us to understand that you are the one that we need to put our faith and trust into. And that as we've done that, God, that you want to, to just shine through us and add light into dark places around us. Help us to do that this Christmas. And we're going to have so much fun together because of you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, church, have a great Sunday and week.